For those of you who have seen last month's video, I promise you that this one will be less creepy, although we are in Woodbury. Uh, <laughs> So we have a theme around here talking about the three things you need to know. Well, this time of year, I figured it might be appropriate to talk about three things that I'm thankful for. First is all of our partner agencies like you. Second are responders who sacrifice time away from family and respond on holidays. And the third, of course, is coffee. So I'm Dr. Peterson with Region ZMS, and this month we're gonna talk about new guideline updates, hypothermia, and remote ischemic conditioning. Stay tuned, because this is Region ZMS Update, and those are the three things you need to know. Last month, I hinted at an upcoming guideline update. Well, this month, I'm gonna do less hinting and more explaining. There's a phrase that some of my medical school professors used frequently. They would say that 50% of what they were teaching us was wrong. They just didn't know which 50%. Every month, new medical research comes out that often challenges some of our long-held practices that we realize were never based in science. We try to review our patient care guidelines at least every two years to make sure that we don't fall victim to those same medical scams. That and the fact that you can only stare at the same document for so long before you stop noticing the typos. Like this one right here. 2018 is not over yet, so we just snuck it in under the wire. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you the 2018 Region ZMS guidelines. I know, I know, calm down. I know that most of you are probably just interested in the changes. Well, good news, the changes this time around are pretty minimal. For those of you who use the Region ZMS mobile guideline app, you'll be getting a notification soon that there's an update to download. For the rest of you, we'll be posting our new updates on the regionzms.com website on the resources page. The biggest change you'll notice is that we've merged in our critical care guidelines. Even though that doesn't directly affect most of you, it was just getting a little too tricky trying to maintain two separate guidelines with cross-references. For the rest of you, here's a quick rundown of the changes that will actually affect you. The Universal Patient Care Guideline now has a box to explicitly authorize you to assist a patient in taking their own medications. Now you can officially help an adrenal insufficiency patient take their own steroid medication. The Behavioral Guideline underwent a few clarifications. Most importantly is the requirement for cardiac and end tidal CO2 monitoring whenever you administer a potent sedative such as ketamine. This was not quite as clear in the previous version. For cardiac guidelines, we have emphasized the consideration of early and rapid transport for cardiac arrest victims with refractory shockable rhythms. We've increased the dose of nitroglycerin for patients in acute pulmonary edema and added remote ischemic conditioning as a treatment for STEMIs. More to come on that in a bit. The remainder of the changes are administrative, such as making all of the dextrose references more generic to allow for any concentration, such as D10, D25, or D50. Nothing that should change your current practice. Realistically, almost all of these changes are simply clarifying what you're already doing and shouldn't cause you any lost sleep or increased stress. Not that it would have anyways, but I have to make this a little dramatic so I don't lose you. So check out the guidelines on our website, and if you haven't, download the Region ZMS smartphone app from the same page, regionzms.com slash resources. And remember, if you have any complaints about the guidelines, my name is Dr. Burnett. Hi, I'm Liz Robinson, the Region ZMS fellow. 
Last year, remote ischemic conditioning, also known as RIC, was introduced into the region's EMS protocols. Today, we'll be reviewing the data and pathophysiology behind the protocol, as well as reviewing the protocol itself. Remote ischemic conditioning is based on trying to prevent reperfusion injury. What is reperfusion injury? This is when the blood flow is restored to the previously ischemic tissue, like in the cardiac cath lab, and sets off an inflammatory cascade. Reactive oxygen species and other inflammatory markers are released from the reperfused myocytes, which cause further damage to the heart tissue in addition to initial ischemic injury. The goal of remote ischemic conditioning is to decrease the inflammatory cascade, which in turn decreases the damage done by the heart attack. Ischemic conditioning has been researched by cardiologists since the 1980s with robust animal studies. In 2010, a randomized trial brought remote ischemic conditioning into the hands of EMS providers in Denmark. Unfortunately, there was no statistical significance between the small set of patients that received remote ischemic conditioning and those that did not, but it did show promise in increasing myocardial salvage and proved to be very low risk. So how does this translate to you? The inclusion criteria for RIC includes any patient with a STEMI on EKG that is being transported to a cardiac cath lab capable hospital. The exclusion criteria are as follows. Patients who have already received thrombolytics to treat their STEMI, highly unlikely in this area. History of blood clots in the arm. History of mastectomy or dialysis fistula. Blood pressure below 100 or currently on a vasopressor. Do you want me to go over the procedure again? I'll take your silence as a yes. Better yet, Dr. Campos already covered this earlier this year, so let's bring him back for a quick reprise. The protocol will involve inflating a blood pressure cuff to 200 millimeters of mercury on an upper extremity and leaving it inflated for a full five minutes. After five minutes, the cuff will be deflated. Each inflation and deflation sequence makes up one cycle. This process should be repeated four times if time allows. One thing to keep in mind is the need for pain control if the patient has any discomfort with the procedure. This is typically not a big concern and would be far outweighed by the protective benefits. Remote ischemic conditioning should not delay standard STEMI care, nor should it delay the time of transport of a patient to a cath lab capable facility. Some EMS agencies will have shorter transport times and may not be able to fully implement this protocol, which is okay. The region's ED and cath lab will continue the RIC procedure if started by EMS and is currently the only facility in the area to be doing this procedure. Let's simplify this even more. Once you've started moving towards the hospital, inflate the cuff for five minutes, deflate it for five minutes, and repeat up to four cycles until you get to the hospital. Easy peasy. Get it? Got it? Good. I've had my heat going for a few weeks, so I guess it's time to review hypothermia. According to the CDC, there's an average of 1,300 hypothermia deaths per year in America, with about 67% of victims being male. The biggest risks for hypothermia include advanced age, mental illness, drug or alcohol addiction, and homelessness. While most deadly hypothermia occurs below freezing temperatures, a little bit of rain and wind, even at normal fall temperatures, can lead to some cold patients. Hypothermia. It's something you see all too often in movies starring Leonardo DiCaprio. But what is it exactly? And how does it really happen? Our body is always trying to maintain a balmy temperature of around 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit, or 37 degrees Celsius. Hypothermia occurs when our body loses heat faster than we can produce it. And hypothermia doesn't only strike sinking ship victims and 19th century fur trappers wandering in the wilderness. Studies estimate that about 1,500 Americans die of accidental hypothermia each year. In fact, exposure to the cold is responsible for twice as many deaths as heat exposure annually. Young children and the elderly are especially vulnerable. So why is hypothermia so dangerous? Most heat loss occurs when unprotected surfaces radiate heat away from the body. In addition, wearing wet clothes makes heat loss even worse. 
and wind chill can quickly escalate the situation because it strips away the thin layer of heat on the skin's surface. As your temperature drops, your body and brain fire back. Your thyroid and adrenal glands release a flood of hormones that boost your metabolism, heart rate, and blood pressure. In the brain, the hypothalamus tells your blood vessels to constrict. This moves the blood further from the skin's surface where heat can escape. Your hypothalamus also signals your muscles to shiver, which kicks your metabolism into overdrive two to five times the normal rate. At this point, you're on the brink. If you don't get to safety soon, you'll hit severe hypothermia and be in serious trouble. Eventually, even your brain will grow colder. When this happens, it stops functioning properly, which can make you feel dizzy, disoriented, and even want to strip naked. Before too long, you'll run the risk of permanent brain damage. But just how long do you have? It's hard to know because each situation and person is completely different. However, radiologist Anna Bagenholm currently holds the record for surviving the coldest body temperature. After a skiing accident, she endured 80 minutes in freezing cold water. Her body temperature had plummeted to 56.7 degrees Fahrenheit or 13.7 degrees Celsius. Hopefully that never happens to you, but here are some tips for treating hypothermia with several safety measures. Immediate first aid. Victims can also be treated with warm IV fluids and saltwater solutions. And you can help avoid hypothermia with some safety measures, like wearing appropriate clothing, avoiding overexertion in cold conditions, and letting people know what time you expect to arrive. Run smart, travel smart, and dress smart, even if it makes you look like a giant marshmallow. Let's talk a little bit about the stages of hypothermia. In mild hypothermia, a patient will present with shivering, but should otherwise have a normal mental status. These patients will benefit from the same care your mom provided when you came in from sledding as a kid. Cold, wet clothes off, warm blankets and heat packs, humidified air, and paramedics can add warm IV fluids. As a patient progresses into moderate hypothermia, they will likely have decreased mental status and stop shivering. This occurs around 87 degrees Fahrenheit. When a patient is so cold that they stop shivering, we avoid active rewarming to prevent core afterdrop, also called rewarming collapse. This occurs when cold blood from poorly perfusing extremities gets mobilized towards the warmer core by vasodilation, paradoxically dropping the body's core temperature. At these lower temperatures, patients may go into unstable cardiac dysrhythmias or cardiac collapse. In the field, these patients should be thermally stabilized, not rewarmed, but not allowed to cool further. So bring them into your warm ambulance, remove their wet clothing, and apply a room temperature blanket. What changes when a patient is pulseless? First, verify they actually are pulseless. Take at least 45 seconds to check for a pulse. If truly pulseless from hypothermia, only one round of ACLS measures, including medications and defibrillations, are recommended. After that, contact medical control for direction and transport the patient to the hospital with ongoing CPR. Make sure to transport to a regional trauma center in hypothermic arrest if the core temperature is below 93 degrees Fahrenheit. Why a trauma center? Severely hypothermic patients require active internal warming. Depending on their cardiovascular status and temperature, they may receive warm fluids irrigated through chest tubes, their peritoneum, or a central line. For patients in cardiac arrest, they may receive ED ECMO, a thoracotomy with left chest irrigation, or at Regions Hospital, cardiopulmonary bypass in the OR. Unlike typical cardiac arrests, neurologic outcomes are significantly higher as hypothermia has a neuroprotective effect. So warm those shivering patients up, keep your non-shivering patients from cooling down, and get your pulseless hypothermic patients to a trauma center. Well, that brings us to the end of yet another Region ZMS Update video. Thanks to Woodbury Public Safety for helping out. And to Dr. Liz Robinson for just generally being cool, but especially for stepping up this month to contribute some wisdom. For the rest of you, be thankful this month. Eat lots of turkey. Don't throw water on the fire when you try to deep fry your turkey inside your house. 
And if that chest pain doesn't go away, it might not actually be indigestion. You should probably have that looked at. Now for my usual pitch to promote our social media pages. We're trying to be more active and post some relevant news stories and articles that might be of interest to you, so even more reason to friend and follow us. For the Regions EMS gang, I'm Dr. Peterson. And I'm Dr. Robinson. Stay smart, stay safe, and stay professional. Thanks for all you do.